I know the one thing we did right hey! was the day we started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on. As I'm sure you all well know, as I hope you all well know, today, April 4th, 2018, is the 50th anniversary of the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I thought I would commemorate the occasion by sharing my thoughts on Dr. King, his legacy, and what lessons we can learn from him and his life, particularly some aspects of his life that are not as commonly emphasized as others. I wanted to start by just saying very quickly that I think that we should be aware of and willing to discuss Dr. King's flaws, his shortcomings, as well as his strengths. As great a hero as he was, not only an African-American hero, but an American hero, full stop, he was still ultimately human. He was a fallible, living, breathing human being just like the rest of us, which means sometimes he said, thought, and believed things that were wrong, just like the rest of us. Those things would include one particular character flaw of his that has been well known for about a generation or so now, namely his philandering. Yes, folks, for those of you who hadn't gotten the memo yet, Dr. King was serially unfaithful to his wife, Coretta. He was known to be a womanizer, a player, if you will. From what I've read, on one occasion, he was in the middle of a sexual tryst with another woman and even said, I'm effing for God, believe it or not. He was aware that the way he was living his life in that particular area of his life was not particularly godly, not consistent with Christian doctrine and teachings. But hey, like I said, he was human. And ever since I first became a history buff, when I was a wee lad of about eight years old, I've believed very strongly in the warts and all school of history. I don't believe in teaching or learning a sanitized, whitewashed version of history that seeks to present even heroic historical figures like Dr. King only in the most positive light possible. Frankly, I think history is a lot more interesting to study and learn about when we become familiar with the character flaws in a lot of these great historical figures, as well as with their good points, with their vices, as well as with their their virtues. What's more, at the end of the day, it's a more honest and accurate way to both teach and learn history. So that's where I'm at. Second of all, I wanted to draw attention to one particularly little known aspect of Dr. King's life, namely the fact that he actually owned guns, particularly early in the civil rights struggle, kept them in the house for self-defense, and even went so far as to apply for a concealed carry permit from the state of Alabama. Of course, they denied it to him, since the tradition in southern states was to violate the Second Amendment rights of African Americans. Later in the civil rights movement, Dr. King's associates, such as Bayard Rustin, taught him more about the nonviolent philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi and convinced him to do away with his gun arsenal. But even in the last few years of his life, in the late 60s, as the black power movement replaced the civil rights movement in the headlines, Dr. King still wisely drew an important distinction between keeping and bearing arms, particularly in the home or on one's person, for self-defense, and on the other hand, using violence, particularly armed violence, as part of an organized political campaign. He was opposed to the latter, but he continued to support the former even up until the end of his life. And that's one thing I admire about Dr. King, the nuance that he brought to that particular issue. He knew that pure pacifism is not realistic, it's not reasonable. Individuals have the right to defend themselves, particularly when they're not, say, participating in an organized civil rights demonstration, when they are simply, for example, getting out of a car in their own driveway in front of their own house, like Medgar Evers was when he was shot in the back by Byron de la Beckwith in 1963. That brings me to the issue of how people today love to quote Dr. King in a way that's often selective, hypocritical, and disingenuous, and sometimes just flat out wrong, all in the service of their modern political agendas. I think that's a huge mistake. For example, in the spring of 2015, after the riots in Baltimore following the death of Freddie Gray at the hands of Baltimore police, I saw a number of articles being published throughout the blogosphere with titles like Riots Work. The idea being that we shouldn't preach to members of the black community about the folly of rioting because historically riots have supposedly produced results. I actually thought those analyses were very short-sighted and simplistic and they just left out a lot of countervailing evidence. I think when you look at all the facts, you'll see that rioting does more harm than good. And although some riots in history have led to some political gains, in the end it wasn't worth it, if only because riots tend to be exploited by our political opponents to build support for draconian, tough-on-crime law and order 
criminal justice policies that end up stuffing America's prisons chock full of young black and brown men. For example, the race riots of the late 1960s, such as those that followed Dr. King's assassination exactly 50 years ago today, It's too late now. We are ready to start. We're going to finish it up. Helped usher in the era of Republican political ascendancy, with politicians like Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan running on tough on crime, law and order tickets and platforms. That helped make things like the war on drugs possible. So in the end, I think race riots do more harm than good politically, and at the same time, I oppose them on moral grounds because they tend to destroy the property and endanger the safety of individuals who are not directly connected to the injustices that the rioters are responding to. So for example, in 1992, during the LA riots, after the acquittal of the police officers who beat the crap out of Rodney King, you had people like Reginald Denny, the white trucker who was pulled from the cab of his truck and bashed in the head with a blunt object and almost died, and I think is still suffering health consequences because of that to this very day. Since riots constitute such an unfocused, disorganized, undisciplined form of violence, they tend to cause the kind of collateral damage that really just makes the whole endeavor not worthwhile. After the Baltimore riots in 2015, after the looting of a CVS in a black neighborhood in Baltimore, you saw an increase in illegal drugs circulating on the streets of black neighborhoods, and you saw a spike in the local crime rate in a city that was already suffering from sky-high rates of violent crime. Ordinary, innocent black folks paid the price for those riots in the longer term. In the aftermath of those riots, I heard a lot of people quoting Dr. King's statement, a riot is the language of the unheard. Dr. King did say that, and he was right to urge society to consider the root causes of the riot and to deal with those root causes. However, in the very same statement in which Dr. King uttered that famous phrase, he still expressed his opposition, moral and pragmatic, to the practice of rioting. Riots are socially destructive and self-defeating. Violence will only create more social problems than they will solve. In a real sense, it is impractical for the Negro to even think of mounting a violent revolution in the United States. So I will continue to condemn riots and continue to say to my brothers and sisters that this is not the way. He was still opposed to it, no matter how much his modern admirers might like to gloss over that fact. On the right, meanwhile, you have a lot of conservatives nowadays, typically white conservatives, who love to cite that one famous quote, that cliched, overused quote from the I Have a Dream speech at the March on Washington in 1963, to the effect that Dr. King would oppose race-conscious public policies such as affirmative action if he were alive today. I don't buy it. Dr. King actually said things during his life that suggest he would probably have supported affirmative action. For example, on one occasion, Dr. King said, a society that has for so long done something special against the Negro must now do something special for the Negro. It is a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. So, I don't buy this idea that Dr. King would have been opposed to affirmative action or other similar policies were he alive today. But that brings me to another point. Look. Dr. King wasn't perfect. He wasn't right about absolutely everything under the sun. He was human like the rest of us. If you have some disagreement, a good faith, well-reasoned, well-thought-out disagreement with one of Dr. King's positions on some of the issues he addressed in his day, feel free to say so. Just feel free to say that you respectfully disagree with the position that Dr. King took. For example, from what I've read, in the last few years of his life, he took to calling himself a socialist in private. As a libertarian, albeit a moderate, pragmatic, realistic one, I don't subscribe to the tenets of socialism. So. I would have to disagree with Dr. King on that particular front. No harm done. No disrespect intended. Why can't people just come out and say that they think Dr. King was mistaken about certain things? Instead of twisting his thought and his track record into a pretzel to try to use it in support of your own modern agenda. Just admit when you think Dr. King was wrong. Just keep it real. Finally, I'd like to turn to the issue of Dr. King's legacy and where we should go from here, what inspiration we should draw from. I've heard a lot of pessimism expressed by young black folks about the progress we've made, particularly in the United States. I've heard a lot of folks say we've marched, rioted, used all these different tactics, and yet 50 years after Dr. King's death, we're still struggling. We even had a black president for two terms, and then he was replaced by the likes of Donald Jackass Trump. Barf. So what are we supposed to do? What can we do? I think it's important for us to put these things in their proper historical perspective. Put the whole struggle in its proper perspective. And then, I read the autobiography of Malcolm X three times. And that makes you a serious student of black history. That's a very important book. Well, baby, you can read that book. You can wear the t-shirt, you can put up the posters, and you can shout the slogans. But unless you know all the history behind it, you're trivializing the entire struggle. 
next year, in the year 2019, African Americans will be able to celebrate, I guess celebrate may not be the word, but next year will mark the 400th anniversary of the first arrival of the first shipload of African slaves on the shores of what was then the Virginia Colony. That's right. Next year, y'all, African descendants will have been in the United States or its colonial precursors for a total of exactly 400 years. Since 1619, baby. Only within the past 50-something years have African Americans begun to enjoy even a semblance or a facsimile of formal, legal, and institutional equality in American society. In other words, for the vast majority of its history, American society as a whole has gone well out of its way to suppress, oppress, and repress its black minority. I don't see it as realistic to think that in that short space of time, in just a couple of generations tops, African Americans would achieve full equality in American society. It takes time to bring about total liberation and to achieve full, not only legal, but also socio-economic and cultural equality in a society that has been unequal for most of its history. So we shouldn't be surprised that African Americans still face struggles today, half a century after the culmination of the civil rights movement, half a century after the death of the greatest civil rights leader America ever knew. By the same token, that doesn't mean that we haven't seen real progress, and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to struggle as we go forward. I will say, I think we need to diversify our portfolio, embrace different tactics and strategies than the ones that were employed mostly with success half a century ago. I don't think that marching in the streets and raising clenched fists and chanting slogans and circulating petitions and staging sit-ins and things of that nature are necessarily going to have the same impact today that they had back in the 50s and 60s. We need to change with the times. One problem I see with black leadership, not only in the United States, but throughout the African diaspora and in African societies as well, black leaders tend to focus on politics and government as the solution to our problems. I go from the house house to the state house, to the court house, to the white house. We will march on, march on, dream on, march on, dream on. Our time has come. That has its place, and even to this day, that's still necessary to some degree. But I do think the time has come for us to emulate other persecuted groups throughout history and focus more on education, business, and the professions, and overall economic and cultural solidarity, building our own strong community institutions and so on, as means to escape from poverty and privation and to ascend into prosperity and power. You have to find your own way, Will. You know, when I was your age, there weren't many doors open to us. Some of them we had to blow open. And because we did, you've got more opportunities. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that things are perfect. It's just that now, you can fight our battles in the boardrooms too. And in the classrooms, the voting booths, and the courtroom, just like your uncle. All right, well, hold up, hold up. I thought you said by any means necessary. Right! But it's up to you to figure out what's necessary. And well, when the courtroom doesn't work, Come find me. We need to build on the achievements of those who came before us, such as Dr. King. We all know, or at least we should know, that we stand on the shoulders of the giants who came before us. Now is the time to build on those struggles and sacrifices so that they will not be in vain. And they're not gonna deny me. I'm an African-American. Hey, Miss Lambchop, stop worrying about integrating and being accepted and start thinking about building for yourself, for our people, so that we can provide a future for our children. Thanks a lot for watching, y'all. If you dug this video at all, then I'd invite you to subscribe to my channel, and specifically, don't forget to click that bell icon right next to the subscribe button so y'all can get down with the fabled notification squad. Thanks a lot. Later.